Today we continue our Voyager 2 series. Last week we closed the chapter looking at the three aspects of our mission. Exploration, colonization, and trade. We open a new chapter today by looking at the four cardinal directions for our voyage. These cardinal directions are the core values that bind us together as a crew. The guiding principles that dictate behavior and action. These cardinal directions help crews know right from wrong, whether we're following the proper course and fulfilling our mission, and they create an unwavering guide for the future. This particular wooden ship belongs to Christ Jesus. And the custom on board this vessel, as it is among vessels in the French Navy, is to engrave four core values at four different places on the ship, fore and aft, port and starboard. So the crew is constantly reminded why we are sailing. At the very front of the ship, engraved into a plaque, is this word, patrie, or in English, looking up from the plaque, we see the bow of the ship rising and falling as the vessel moves forward. Walking to the captain's wheelhouse, we spy a wooden compass box within which a compass floats. And notice we're heading due east. Inscribed on the outside of that box is the word kingdom, and it's directly east. On screen, we can see that compass box with east as the direction of the kingdom. Our first cardinal direction is the kingdom, and our readings from Matthew's gospel will help us orient toward that kingdom. Let's take a look. To understand the importance of this particular cardinal direction, it's necessary to grasp the significance of the kingdom itself. The Anchor Bible Dictionary says the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven is a subject of major importance to the Bible in two primary ways. The first is its frequency in the first three Gospels. The second is because it stands at the very center of the message of the historical Jesus. The kingdom of heaven, as it's known in Matthew, is the message of Jesus and about Jesus. Not just the one pointing to the kingdom, Jesus becomes the lens through which the kingdom of God is seen. Some have argued that since the kingdom is not primarily spatial, territorial, political, or national, it should be translated as kingly rule, reign, or sovereignty instead of kingdom. Yet, Matthew presents this kingdom as drawing near and at hand, all ready. So there is a dimension of that kingdom in the here and now. While that kingdom is anticipated in the church, the church is not yet the kingdom. With that as background, you may recall the logbook, capturing significant insights that are critical for our voyage forward. Here's our first logbook entry. The kingdom is the first and primary direction for our voyage. Once calibrated, all other directions fall into place. Author Stephen Covey says, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. This principle is illustrated in the movie City Slickers, where Billy Crystal is the city slicker listening to the sage advice of Jack Palance as a grizzled cowboy. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. This was an edited version. And I'll paraphrase what the cowboy said. 
one thing, just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean squat. Turn to the reading from our first reading from Matthew with the parables of the hidden treasure and pearl of great price. These two stories are similar in having both the farmer and merchant selling everything for the sake of the one thing. It is upon this farmer and merchant that Jesus pronounces this beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they see God. Purity of heart isn't just about avoiding impure thoughts, but rather a single-minded devotion to the one God with all one's heart. It's not having divided loyalties, attempting to serve two masters, but keeping the main thing the main thing. Jesus tells us the main thing is the kingdom, and it's like a hidden treasure. Or a fine pearl, which in the ancient world symbolized the highest good. The main thing, the one thing, the highest good for which we are to give everything, is the kingdom. It is primary in importance over every other thing. Wealth, work, reputation, even family is secondary at best. Let's turn to our second reading from Matthew and look at verse 33. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Here we see Jesus give the principle of the parables we just heard. Strive first for the kingdom, like a farmer or pearl merchant, and we will receive abundantly more than we can imagine. Strive first for a right relationship with God, and all other relationships will fall into place, wealth, work, reputation, and family. All of these will be rightly ordered and given to us if we put God first and make the kingdom our highest priority. The kingdom is primary in importance as a cardinal direction and therefore first in sequence in the order of calibrating our compass. Once we're striving for the kingdom and know what direction it is, and that direction is east, we can easily calculate other directions. Why is east the direction of the kingdom? Because before there were magnetic compasses, sailors navigated by means of wind compasses, and east was always designated by a cross a Jerusalem cross, and Jerusalem was always in the east. We sail east toward the new Jerusalem. The kingdom is first and primary direction for our voyage. Once calibrated, all other directions fall into place. For those of us tied to our GPS, the prospect of navigating by means of a wind compass is more than a little disconcerting. We know winds shift, (laughs) and ships can get turned around in a storm, especially at night, but once the storm breaks and the sun rises, we can orient ourselves once more because we know that the sun rises in the and sets in the if we know east is this way 
and west is that way, then north must be this way and south that way. We can get our bearings once more, but what happens if the storm continues for days on end and the sun cannot be located? What then? Leave it to those clever Viking navigators to figure out how to find the sun when you can't tell where it is. They discovered that a transparent sunstone of calcite would polarize light and allow them to tell the direction of the sun within a few degrees in both cloudy and twilight conditions. But what happens when our wind compass just got ripped out of our hands by the wind and clumsy Olaf just tripped and pitched the sunstone overboard. What then? <laughs> Thankfully, it wasn't just the Vikings that were clever navigators. So were the Chinese. Somewhere between the second century BC and the first century AD, they invented the compass. But it wasn't until the 11th century that they adapted it for navigation. These early compasses were made with lodestone, also known as the mineral magnetite, a naturally occurring magnet aligned with the Earth's north-south magnetic field. Lodestone comes from the Middle English and means coarse stone or leading stone from the word load, which means journey, or way. This Chinese invention eventually found its way west to Persia and Europe in the 13th century, enabling the determination of heading without sunstone or wind compass. This brings us to our second logbook entry. Mount Zion is Earth's true pole, and our onboard compass has a fragment of that lodestone. The reason magnetic compasses work is because of the spinning molten iron core of the Earth that creates a magnetic field, and compass needles always point north. North is also marked by Polaris, the North Pole Star, around which all other stars rotate. We've already determined that we're on a different kind of voyage on this Ark of Salvation, and since that's the case, our compass points not toward magnetic north, but toward the east. Since that's the direction we're heading, it makes sense that God would provide the means whereby our spiritual compass could find the kingdom, right? Make sense? One translation of Psalm 48 verse 2 says, Mount Zion, the true pole of the earth, the great king's city. And since there's a magnetic pole in Mount Zion, it makes sense there's a polar star there as well to mark that easterly direction. Jesus calls himself the bright morning star in Revelation 22:16, a reference to the planet Venus, the brightest heavenly body in the east that appears before sunrise. The reason our compass points directly east toward the New Jerusalem is because that's where the true pole of the earth is. The reason our compass points directly east toward the great king city is because Mount Zion is composed entirely of magnetite. It tugs at our hearts, points us in the direction of the kingdom, and pulls all kinds of folks from all over the world to voyage there from east and west, 
north and south, all tribes, tongues, and nations are pulled toward that kingdom across the seas. In the words of Hebrews 12, verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We recall that Chinese compasses were made of lodestone aligned with the Earth's magnetic field. Our onboard compass has a fragment of that same lodestone from the mountainous magnet that is Mount Zion. The kingdom that awaits us in its fullness there has a portion of its presence here on this vessel. Mount Zion is Earth's true pole, and our onboard compass has a fragment of that lodestone. We may know it by a different name, the Holy Spirit. Jesus promises his disciples in John's Gospel that although he's departing for that eternal city, he will not leave us orphaned. He will send another advocate to be with us forever. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit will guide us forever, like a compass directing us toward the kingdom. Mount Zion is Earth's true pole. And our onboard compass has a fragment of that lodestone. Here's our third logbook entry. We're magnetized toward that city. Yet other kingdoms misdirect us. The Navigator's Guidebook realigns crews. There are times in our lives when God's direction for us is so evident, so plain, so obvious, so manifest, and so crystal clear. Times when the compass of our heart is locked on target for the kingdom, fixed, immovable, and secured. And those are times when we can step out of the boat and walk on water. We can stride across the waves and sprint toward the heavenly Jerusalem following the tugging of the compass in our heart. We've had those times in our lives, haven't we? Yet, more often than not, we notice a strong wind and become frightened. And the compass in our heart starts spinning like a top. And we begin sinking like Peter. We were striding toward the kingdom, but got misdirected along the way. On our own, it's easy to lose our way. Our individual compass gets compromised, and we head off on a wrong direction. Everybody's compass is compromised. Nobody's immune from course deviations from a faulty compass. The Bible calls this faulty, compromised compass sin. In Hebrew, the idea of sin is missing the mark. And with a compromised compass, we are guaranteed to miss the mark of the kingdom on our way there. 
God made our hearts magnetized for the kingdom. That's our original design. But sin has compromised our ability to find it. Sin is when the kingdoms of this world place ball bearings next to our compass art. Ball bearings don't have to be magnetized to pull us off course. They're made of steel. And they just have to get close enough to our hearts to pull us off course. They just have to get close enough to us, and we'll do the rest and not even realize it. I'm following my heart, we'll say, but our heart is misdirected. The lodestone within us will mistake a steel marble for the magnetite mountain of Mount Zion. Our hearts will gravitate toward a new bearing, a new heading, and off we go somewhere other than the kingdom. We'll go chasing wealth or career or reputation or family, or anything else other than the main thing, the one thing. And our life veers off course. Any other destination than the kingdom dead ends in despair. If we make wealth the one thing, we'll end up like the rich young ruler, sorrowful and grieving. If we make career the one thing, we'll discover too late we labored in vain for what does not satisfy. If we make reputation the one thing, we'll discover that those who make themselves first shall be last. If we make family the one thing, we'll find to our regret that if Christ isn't our first love, then we're not worthy of him. Any other destination than the kingdom dead ends in despair. We may gain the world, but we'll lose our soul. On our own, it's easy to lose our way. Sailing on our own in a little dinghy will never reach the kingdom because our compass is off. The benefit of being amongst a crew on this tall ship is that while each of our individual compasses is compromised, Collectively, we can get a truer reading than we could on our own. How do we do that? By recognizing that the ball bearings on my compass aren't the same as the ones on yours. And the course deviations in your life aren't the same as mine. Jesus said something about that, that it's easier to see the ball bearing on someone else's compass. Then the iron cannonball sitting next to our own. The blessing in being part of a community is that we can help see for others what they and we cannot see on our own. And by removing those ball bearings, and cannonballs, our compasses can read truer than before, and we can see more clearly where we're heading. This is what crewmates who love each other do for one another. Since we do not make this voyage on our own, 
we need all hands on deck to be clear-eyed and aligned with where we're heading. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said it best. Love does not consist in gazing at each other, but in looking outward together in the same direction. Scripture the Navigator's Guidebook helps realign us to look outward, together, in the same direction. We are realigned through worship of God. We are realigned through study of Scripture. We are realigned through service within and beyond this congregation. We are realigned through fellowship with one another. We are realigned by sharing the good news with others about the difference that Christ makes in our lives on this voyage toward the kingdom. We're magnetized toward that city. Yet other kingdoms misdirect us. The Navigator's Guidebook realigns crews. Here's our final logbook entry. Since we sail for that heavenly city, our lives are necessarily oriented toward hope. When Jesus inaugurated his ministry by saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, he was declaring that the long-awaited Messiah had arrived. He proclaimed the prophecies of Isaiah were being fulfilled. Good news to the poor, release for captives, and sight for the blind. The long-awaited hope of Israel and all nations, the light from that bright morning star was twinkling on the horizon. The fullness and brightness of the Messianic age was still below the horizon. But the bright morning star was heralding that it was on its way. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And about his followers, we are the light of the world. We can't help but reflect the light of hope. Can't help but direct our hearts toward that kingdom. And can't help but expect that the one who seated on the throne there is coming to establish his kingdom here. We are confident that the one who began the good work of the kingdom among us will bring it to its completion. We can't help but hope and can't help but have confident expectation. Why? Because as Paul says in Romans 5.5, 5, we have a hope that does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. A compass has been placed in our hearts. A lodestone lodged there by the Holy Spirit that orients us unfailingly toward the kingdom and the hope that awaits us then and embraces us now. Reverend Chris Bronze in a blog shares my family talks about where we're going to meet when we get to the heavenly city. Can you see it? The Lord Jesus sitting gloriously on a throne, a great tree-lined river crashing down from his throne, and vast throngs of people from every part of the world celebrating. I can't wait! 
but I also want to make sure my friends and family know where to meet. Here's the plan. We're all going to meet at the fifth tree on the right side of the river facing the throne. I'm sure I won't meet you all in person. Wouldn't it be cool if the first time you and I shook hands was at the heavenly city before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ? Through faith in Him, you can be there. Come by, fifth tree, right side, facing the throne, at the great celebration of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the kingdom for which we sail. This is the hope that does not fail. And let all on board this vessel of grace say, Amen.